Welcome to the Norris Group Real Estate Podcast, a show committed to bringing you insights from thought leaders shaping the real estate industry. In each episode, we'll dive into conversations with industry experts and local insiders, all aimed at helping you thrive in an ever-changing real estate market, continuing the legacy that Bruce Norris created, sharing valuable knowledge, and empowering you on your real estate journey. Whether you're a seasoned pro or a newcomer, this is your go-to source for insider tips, market trends, and success strategies. Here's your host, Craig Evans. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for joining in today for part two with Chris German, the apartment dealer. So let me let me jump back to, let's say, 2020. Uh, you know, pan- pandemic starts and um, it, it was a strange time in the single family market. You mm-hmm. know, uh, we started with a lot of fear of, you know, what's going to happen. And, and I never forget within probably two weeks of that, all, all of a sudden it was very apparent that, hey, this thing is going gangbusters. Wheels are coming off and we're about to, we better hold on because we got to build, we got to sell as fast as we can go, you know, especially as a builder. You know, one of my companies is a building company and Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to build as fat way. You know, we saw about pricing going up about 40% over the next two years. Uh, what what did the, what did the pandemic do for you guys in in the multifamily space? Did you see a similar trajectory? Did, did, did it, what was it? So, you know, what's interesting is that Bruce was at my event, the fall of 2019. And he, he and I were talking uh, backstage, if you will. And he says, Chris, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a black swan event. Now, Bruce just has this knack to like see things come in. And obviously he didn't know COVID was coming. I don't think he was in cahoots with the Chinese or something, but uh, he's talking about this. He's talking about this black swan event that if it came, what it would mean to real estate. And I'm going, well, you know, well, what could that be? You know, and, and so it's interesting then sure enough, come March, here we go. COVID now with the single family space. Oh, but let me go back for a second. So, as Bruce is going through the charts, he's, he's saying, look, we have a problem because affordability is very attractive. And uh, when you look at uh, income, income is very attractive. Why aren't homes selling was kind of like his question at the fall of 2019. Affordability is there. Income is there. Well, what gives? And, it, and if we aren't selling homes with these parameters, tell me how we are going to sell homes. So as, as you and I bring that up because as you look at COVID, yes, of course, interest rates came down even further. But I don't think that was the biggest catalyst of people buying homes. Now, for anyone who's ever done any type of study of of human behavior and what have you, my gut tells me that was, of course, a big piece of it. But you're telling me that the same person who would put on booties, gloves, a mask, you know, the whole nine, that's just to go get toilet paper. That same person risked life and limb to go to an open house with 30 and 40 people. So what was it that drove them to do this? And I think, again, it was a lot about human behavior. They, they, been, they had been stuck in the house. They're realizing now that, hey, I, I'm, I, I live this busy life. I never even pay attention to my accommodations. But now that I've been forced to be home for some time, maybe I would like something better. And maybe I'm not gonna live as long as I thought I was going to. And, and I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm not immortal. So I need to start thinking about some of these bigger ideas. And it really was driven by emotion. So people can say, well, I did it for a rational reason. Look, we decide emotionally and we justify rationally. And that's not me. That's Tony Robbins, anyone who studied his work. And it's all the time. It proves out. So why? So that so that's the setup. So now let's get to multifamily. So you have tenants who now are told they can work from home, this this new work from home paradigm. Same issue, Pete, they're at the apartment saying, well, you know, I got to be here all the time. You know, I, I need more space. Now, I, maybe I need a, a space for at home office. I can look at uh, living further. I was only living and getting gouged for, you know, L.A. rent prices because I, I had to be within driving distance of the office. But now I can move to the suburbs. And that's exactly what happened. So as rents were falling in L.A. County and vacancy increasing, you look at like San Bernardino County, just to the east, rental rates were skyrocketing. Vacancy went down to next to nothing, literally. And these counties are what, 30 minutes apart, two different dynamics. And so, again, people were 
they, they were moved, they were looking for space, they were looking for affordability to get out of the city. And so, of course, investment real estate is tied to val uh, uh, the, uh, the income, the value is tied to the income. And so uh, rental rates are going up, vacancies coming down, investors saw an opportunity, people started refinancing loans at, you know, 3%. Now they have money that they got to deploy. Um, they can buy, you know, if now you're talking about the interest rate was lower than the cap rate, something that we hadn't seen, and I don't know how long, that, that's a good, uh, you know, uh, opportunity there. But now, so everyone jumped in, you took advantage of a three and a half percent rate. Well, rates aren't three and a half percent anymore. Some of these loans are coming due. So anyone who's reading the articles and following it, and, and this is one of the points I made at our educational event, our economy has a ticking time bomb when it comes to commercial real estate. There's something like $860 billion worth of commercial real estate loans that are coming due just this year, and next year is even more. Why is that a problem? Well, again, these individuals have a loan at 3.5%. When it adjusts, it's going to go to six and a half, somewhere between 65 and 8%, depending on, on uh, what it's tied to, what index. And so they're not going to be able to refinance and get the same loan dollars. They're going to have to bring cash to the closing table. They may not have the cash. It may, the property may not cash flow at the new interest rate. So it's going to be interesting. Now, of course, I think you're going to see more of that in the office sector, um, retail sector. We'll see what that's going to mean to multifamily. But everybody has the same problem. I even have that on one of my own buildings. We In 2020, I bought a building. Uh, we were able to get a loan that was interest only at 3% for three years. Well, this July, it burns off. Oh, in 2021, I took that loan. And so I'm looking at the, as we adjust to the new rate, you know, my cash flow is going to be much different. Now, luckily, I've done a good job raising rents over time. We've improved the property so I can handle that increase in mortgage. But many cannot, especially because, again, we have rent control. So it's going to be interesting what that means to the market. It, it's one of the seven things that I think need to be uh, on landlords' minds as, as the top seven um, obstacles we're looking at right now uh, as investors. So it'll be interesting where we go from here. So last year in June, uh, at our event, you, you were you were one of the, the panelists, you were on stage, you were talking, you, and I remember you mentioned about how difficult it was to be a landlord at times in California, but because of the legislations and and oftentimes how, how much they favor the renters. Um, I know you talked earlier today about some of the new legislation coming out, but but where is that at in the state of California? Is it better? Is it worse? What, what do you see coming forward out of that? Oh, it's only going to get worse. So Mike Brennan, who's the, evic <laughs> who's the eviction attorney that uh, speaks at our educational events, he's also uh, involved in the uh, legislature. So he, in other words, he sees the laws that are being dreamed up. And at our last event, he went through what's on the wish list, if you will, of the politicians. And you cannot imagine some of the things that these guys dream up. And if any of that were to come to pass, it would just be horrible. But where we are right now is just this year alone, about 24 laws were signed into law by our great governor that affect just housing. 24. I bet you landlords can't name two. And that has been the way it's gone. And not to mention... Not one of those are in a landlord's favor. So it's not like we're saying legislation is being passed because it's helping out the land. No, 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 no. Everything is being done to protect the landlords at the state level. Now, let's talk about uh, the county level. County, L.A. County, moved in and said, well, we know better than the state. And in the unincorporated area, so certain, uh, certain cities, uh, a part of that city is, say, in the county area. They have their own version of rent control. Then there's whole cities that said, we know better than the state and the county. We're going to dream up our own rent control. And so they've put that in motion. And what that means is, like in California, the ceiling on rental increases is 10%. Some cities have rental increases as low as 3%, if you can imagine. So you won't even keep pace with inflation. That's rent control. But when you look at things like uh, a new law this year, you cannot charge... Uh, more security deposit than one month's rent. Well, that affects things. Um, and 
like I said, vacancy control is on going to be on the ballot. This is a real thing. So for those of you in California, look it up. It's called the Justice for Renters Act. Again, for a review, single family homes will be under rent control. New construction will be under rent control. And if you own a multifamily property and you get a vacancy, you'll have a politician determining how much you can rent that unit for. So uh, for those that are landlords, I suggest you uh, speak to your representatives, email, call, do something. You know, that's been one of, one of the problems here is that in large part, the landlords thought that the trade organizations like the apartment, the associations, the different apartment owners associations were going to do all the heavy lifting. Well, there's only so much they can do and they've done what they can and they fundraised and, and try to do what they can. But. I've had many landlords that tell me, Chris, I went to the city meeting where the city is talking about rent control and there's five landlords and 150 tenants and they're all yelling at the back of the room. So who do you think the politicians here, five landlords or, or the tenants, number one, number two, if, if I'm a politician and what keeps me, keeps my jo job security is votes, well, there's more tenants than there are landlords and that's the right. state of affairs. So it's only going to get more difficult. And I think. One of the overarching themes of our last event was here in California, if you're a landlord, you need to decide, are you in or are you out? And by that meaning, if you're in, then you need to grow economies of scale because all these new laws are impacting mom and pop landlords. The smaller you are, the more difficult it's going to be to uh, maneuver these things. And if you can't stomach the laws just as they are today, you're really not going to be happy tomorrow. And so it's probably time for you to look at your exit, whether you go out of state, maybe you purchase like, you know, what you guys offer the single family homes as rentals where you guys have it all. I mean, what you guys have is a great program where it's the new construction and you guys have the management in place and everything else. Maybe people should, should consider something, something because, uh, in California, given given the politics, they can pass about just anything that they want. And so it, you know, landlords need to be aware of that. Well, I, I think that's interesting that you're saying that because I, I was even, um, I, I was speaking recently uh, in South Carolina at a big event and, and, and it amazed me. I, I probably in the next hour after I came off stage, I probably had somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, people there that were there at the event come up, talk to me that they were from California and they're talking to me about all of the issues that are coming about to them from the landlord. And they were literally at their wits end, you know, and I kept trying to tell them, listen, that there, there's a reason the reality is to this point, I have stayed out of California with my personal investing. Um, I, th I think there's still some, some, some good things in the economy. There's some crazy things in the, in the politics there, but, um, you know, you're there, you're in the nick of, in the thick of that day in and day out, uh, for, for people that are listening, you, you just gave a few things there, but I think what, what would you as, what would you advise landlords, uh, to do, to protect themselves, to get, to get ahead of the issues, things like that, that California's legislature is bringing or may bring, I, I, I know you don't have the, the, the crystal ball, but I, you know, we're, we're, I think people right. are looking at this issue. It's a hot button. You know, how, how do they get ahead of that? Well, you know, so it's funny. Since the passage of rent control, the number one statement that landlords have told me is, you know, Chris, before rent control, I didn't raise my rents that often because I was trying to help the tenants and I didn't want to seem like a greedy landlord or what have you. But now that they've passed rent control, I'm hammering the tenants and I'm raising it to the maximum or whatever is allowable year after year. So rent control does the opposite of what the politicians intend, and they, even though they believe otherwise. And, and uh, landlords just need to be aware that there's more coming down the pike. Again, envision a world where let right now we're allowed 10% ceiling in California. I imagine that won't last for long, especially since individual cities now are cutting that in half or even less than half. So envision a world where uh, your rental increases are diminishing over time. And if this vacancy control thing passes, even you in, in the rare event that you get a vacancy and this would be your one opportunity to take a unit that was grossly under market to market or above market actually your new rent is going to be predicated on what the previous tenant was paying imagine that and so so what do you do now what you do now is under the guise of the law unless your city has some special rent control in place 
you give your tenants a notice to vacate to do substantial improvements. It's still legal as of now. It changed a little bit um, as of April 1st, and I'll mention that in a moment. But what, what am I referring to here? Under statewide rent control, you can lawfully give a tenant a 60-day notice to vacate if you plan to do substantial improvement. Substantial improvement being new plumbing, new electrical. They actually mentioned that in the law itself, things like this. But the work you're going to do would, would cause you to pull permit. And now with the change on April 1st, you actually pull permit. And you have to give the tenant a notice of the scope of work to be done, of why it's going to take more than 30 days uh, time. So, of course, this takes an analysis. What's the current tenant paying versus what you believe market rate will be? What that differential is, how, how long would it take you to recoup those monies in terms of the rehab cost? But rule of thumb, at least as the way that I've been told and the way we teach it as well, and what we, I follow as an investor is if you can recoup those monies in about two and a half years time, it's worth going through the substantial improvement. Now, why would you do this? Well, obviously, uh, maybe, you know, you, you can't do all the units. Maybe you, that's not, you can't afford that. But as many units as you can, get those units to market so that if we unfortunately get vacancy control or something like it, as many of your units in your portfolio that you own, as you go forward, and even if they lower rental increases, say to 3%, well, at least it's 3% of a higher number, not 3% of a rent already that's 50% below market. So most of what I own, I would say probably 85% of my units have all been turned and are above market rental rates. It comes down to cash flow here in California, given the risk involved, the complexity of being a landlord, not to mention your time and money you have invested. I believe you should have the greatest return possible on that investment. It comes back down to cash flow. The cash flow is going to impact your equity. Your equity is going to impact how much growth you can have over time, whether that be you know taking out equity, buying other properties, doing 1031 exchanges. It's going to matter in your later years, seeing you through your, through your retirement. And then when the kids inherit the property, whoever the heirs are, you can only imagine, given inflation and what else, how much money they're going to need to be able to replicate the same lifestyle that you've enjoyed. So any growth that you do today, your heirs definitely will thank you for. And the work you do on the rental rates, it'll mean that much more equity, net wealth you've passed on to them, and monthly cash flow. These are some of the things I think investors should be thinking about. Um, yeah, and, and I was, I was just, as you were sitting there talking through that, I, I can't remember in the multifamily space, because uh, I know there's some stuff that just changed on the 45L credit side of things. And I know this is more of a, a tax situation, but I, I know uh, if I remember right, there was some, some changes that just came to that space that allow multifamily uh, to take some of those credits for some of the major upgrades, especially when you're talking about mechanical, things like that. Uh, so that'll be an interesting play to see how some of those things shake out as well within some of the, the credits as well. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, Chris, I, I remember when I owned, uh, when I had, I don't know, probably 35, 40% of my portfolio uh, was multifamily. This was 20 plus years ago. Uh, I, I, I noticed how inflation at, at that time and, and the way I was tracking through then seemed to affect my multifamily uh, a little more than it did my single family. Um, do, do you see that as the case? Well. I don't even know if that's a question you answer because I, you know, you, you don't deal with a lot of SFRs, but, um, you know, with that process, how, how closely are you monitoring fed? And, and I know you talked about your prediction with, with the fed on their rate changes, things like that, but wh where do you see the, 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 um, the basis of inflation against multifamily in the state of where things are at today? So, if you look at here locally in California, the markets that we service, tenants are utilizing about 60% or more of their discretionary income to pay for rent. So historically, rule of thumb has been that inflation is good for real estate. It drives values up because it should, should drive the rents up. Well, the, the one issue we have, uh, at least here recently, is that we had historic gains when it comes to rental rates in 2020 and 2021. The, the biggest growth that we've ever seen ever in history. So we took our rental rates to the hill and then inflation came. So 
tenants were already being stretched on the rental rates. Now at the grocery store and elsewhere, uh, you know, since the new presidency, inflation's gone up at least say 20% or more, depending on, you know, who you're talking to or who's lying to you. But uh, the, the point is tenants are being, uh, they're stretched. And we see that rental rates have pulled back a little bit. We've seen a vacancy increase a little bit. So if inflation were to continue, now at the same time, you may have heard uh, here, fast food restaurants, they had to take their minimum wage to $20 an hour. So I guess, you know, in that respect, you know, maybe some of that money should flow out and should affect things. Um, from what I've read, that means that there's only going to be more layoffs, but I mean, we'll see. Um, but uh, I, I just don't know that it, it's going to, again, inflation will be as much of a gift to real estate as it typically has, because if anything, our clientele, the tenants, they're, they're being eaten alive, you know, with the state of affairs as it is. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. well, that, that's what I wanted to ask you, you know, because I, I was looking at their own stuff as well. You know, the, the, the rates were already being raised pretty early, especially in through COVID when everything, the, the supply and demand factor was kicking in and, and rates were already climbing. Then once, it, you know, uh, inflation hit a little different scenario in the markets that we're in. Uh, but, but in the markets that you're in, once the inflation really started kicking in, what, what have you guys seen in relation to the evictions in the multifamily space? You know, well, through COVID, we saw a big jump in evictions, of course, because of all that meant, you know, and, and, some of that was fueled by the politicians because essentially they were saying, hey, Mr. Tenant, you don't have to pay rent. And so those that assumably could decided not to and then got burned by that because once things changed, then, then many of them were met several months behind, couldn't make up the difference. And so we've seen a big uptick in evictions. To where we are today, I would say it's back to business as usual. Uh, landlords are collecting uh, the vast majority of uh, their rent. Um, and at least, you know, that's the case for me. And I haven't really heard a big, uh, you know, outcry from our clientele saying, you know, Hey, Chris, what gives, you know, a lot of people are behind, you know, uh, tenants are paying. Um, but at the same time, I don't, uh, well, I just read a study. They looked at the 12 top metros, uh, Los Angeles is only slated to see a 1% increase in rental rates this year. And that goes back to, because again, we had these historic gains it's hard to push the rents any further, at least for the for the time being. And so if an investor is smart, a landlord is smart, you take a look at, you know, what the rental rates are in the local area. Um, maybe you pause your rental link. You know, if you're already at market or above market like we are with some of our properties, you might take a pause and say, you know what? You don't just raise it for the sake of raising it because you might find yourself with a vacancy. Um, and so you, you have to just, you know, just know your market, you know, People can use tools like uh, Rentometer or Zillow to take a look at, you know, what the rental rates are and, and just be smart about your rental increases. At the same time, I'm not saying don't raise your rents. For most of you, raise your rents because I know that your rents are well below market. But for those of you that have been proactive, now's a time of caution. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, so, so much about the multifamily space because of the size and scale, which you talked a few minutes ago about the financing of it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a different game on how you finance, uh, multifamily considered to, or in, in consideration to SFRs. Uh, for, so from, from a single family to a multifamily space, you know, based on where interest rates are at now, things like that, what, what's the, what's the kind of the talk in your town, the chatter in your world in relation to, uh, new deals coming forward based on where rates are at right now. Are people, are you seeing as much? Are you seeing that people, is that even slowing? I guess maybe a second part of the question, are you seeing as much action going? Are people slowing down transactionally because they have to bring more cash to the table? So last year was a just a dismal year. <laughs> and which is interesting because the year prior, at least for me personally, was a historic year. 2022 was a historic year. 2023, our business got chopped like in half. Now, half of my business is still pretty good. Most people would, you know, Chris, what are you crying about? But, I, but with respect to uh, if we're talking about just the flow of inventory, first quarter this year, we started out very strong. We've had a very good first quarter. But now let's take a look at those sales. 
many of those individuals, at least again, my personal sales were individuals exiting real estate altogether. They don't like the right. Now, these are individuals that have been in the market for some time. So these are not say individuals your age or my age. And they're saying, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm folding, you know, I'm folding, forget it. No, these are individuals that have been landlords for some time. And they're saying, you know what? This isn't what I signed up for. This is not the world of investing that I knew two decades ago. Now, the pendulum that used to be in the favor of landlords has definitely swung in favor of the tenants, especially here locally. And so I'm out now in getting out. And we talk about how the interest rates impact things. It, it impacted the value of the properties that they sold, of course, because um, they didn't do a good job keeping up on the rental uh, increases. So again, the new buyer coming behind them is saying, hey, great building, but I'm taking on the, for all the same reasons you're selling, I'm taking on those headaches. So I need a certain rate of return. Now, when you look at the market at large, it's, it is somewhat slow. Uh, we just, I just had my staff um, the end of last week. Hey, let's take a look at what's sold first quarter, the corridors we work, what's pending, what's active. I mean, it, it's, not, it's nothing to write home about. And again, it's, it's this, this reality of, of landlords saying, I'm not comfortable lowering my price or my price expectations because of interest rates. And uh, they're not, they don't, if they don't have a need, they're some, somewhat staying pat. But for those where the loans are coming due, they're having to refi, the cash flow is getting hit. Uh, they're the folks that are saying, okay, yeah, I need to relook at things um, because it's about your rate of return. You'd be surprised when we evaluate properties for clients, the average rate of return on equity, a return on equity that we see is about 4%. They think it's much higher. They think, well, how can that be? My, you know, my tax basis is low. My property's free and clear. Well, exactly. So your rate of return, because you haven't done great on the rental increases is say <laughs> about 4%. That, that should, shouldn't that, I mean, you could take your money out and put it in treasuries, bonds, put it in a high yield CD and have no tenant worries for five to 6%, right? And here you are. So, you know, these are things that people are contemplating too, especially as things readjust and saying, okay, maybe I need to, I need to do something differently. But uh, yeah, it is somewhat slow. Interest rates are definitely the culprit because it's not vacancy, buildings are full. It's not rental rates because we're still uh, riding on the waves of historic gains. So what is it? It's the interest rates. People are not excited about you know, as of today, somewhere between six and a half, six point seven percent, and we really are uh, at the line in the sand. If you look at what's taken place over the last few days with treasuries, because commercial real estate is uh, large in part tied to you know where the treasury market is, um, we are at a line in the sand where we could see seven again. As much as I fear what that would mean, and maybe even higher. So. People right now that are like, no, I'm going to wait for that decrease in June that the Fed keeps talking about, and then I'll refi or then I'll lock or something. Your savior may not be coming. And so you right. might want to take a look at what reality is today, because you might, again, I'm not an economist. These are just fr from the sources that I respect and, and what I'm looking at and reading. This is what I'm, you know, this is what I'm being told. Well, you know, one of the things I think that is so interesting, and I hope our listeners hear you say today, you've talked so many times about uh, multifamily landlords that have not kept up with rent increase. It, it's it's easy to talk about and blame the rent game that rents are so high. Uh, but Chris, I think you and I have probably both seen a lot of that to where, um, as you said, the small mom and pop investors uh, and landlords uh, they have not always kept up with, with what current rents are, should be, you know, what is that going to affect and do to their portfolio down the road from a finance perspective or, or from a value perspective, and they end up getting caught. And, uh, and, and I think it, that's one of the things that I, as I've sat here and just kind of reminding myself through, that was one of the things we had to manage in our own portfolio a lot more aggressively, you know, because it's easy when you've got a bunch of SFRs, you can start picking and choosing when you've got that multifamily conglomerate that you've got to start working through and in rental increases, it, it's it's a different animal. And 
And what I've seen with so many people is they would oftentimes get comfortable in the magnitude of money that came out of the one product and got blinded by the aspect of seeing, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of cash coming there, but is it true positive cash flow? And, and, and they got, they got lost in that and didn't raise their rents when they really should have. And you again, know, Oh, sorry, that's good enough. But one of the points I make uh, to investors is that worked two or three decades ago. You you could have bought and bought just about any property three decades ago, and you wake up today a millionaire, not knowing much, not doing you know intense studies annually on your rate of return. You would have done just fine. There wasn't much law to really navigate and, and so forth in the politics, but it, it's, a, it's a much different world today. You have to be much more intentional. I'll use that word intentional about your investments here locally um, because it's, it, it's a different uh, paradigm. And for those landlords that are like, well, I just don't want to be seen as a greedy landlord. Look, I just took a client out and a lender out to dinner to a nice steakhouse here locally. Now, when I made the reservation, I know what I signed up for, that eating there was going to mean about double than if I went to, say, an average steakhouse. But why did I do it? Because of the ambiance, the food, the quality, um, what that means to our brand. Um, we like to deliver service. So I wasn't barking at that uh, steakhouse saying, well, you know, after all, you know, there's inflation and people are being eaten alive. Don't you guys think you should bring down the price? No, I, I, I you, you get what you pay for. So when it comes to rentals, you are a greedy landlord. If your units are all beat to hell and there's leaks everywhere and, and they just, you know, they're not appealing to the tenants. Yeah. And if you're trying to get market rate at the same time, you're a greedy landlord, but if you've done and stayed on top of capital improvements, uh, your property, you would want to live in your own property. Let me put it that way. I'll shorten my comments. And this is what I, the rule that my wife and I live by. If you would live in your own rental, then there is no problem with you asking as much rent as the market will bear because you're that high quality steakhouse. And if they don't want the high quality steakhouse, there's options in the market. They can go and rent somewhere else where the landlord uh, doesn't care as much. And he's more or he or she's more of the first example that I gave. But have a good quality product that you're offering, focus on your capital improvements, modernize your units because millennials are the big, biggest segment of the uh, rental population today. And here locally, these folks will give you money hand over fist if you're giving them a nice modernized unit in a safe community that they feel good about bringing friends and family over to entertain. They'll gladly pay you. You know, on average, we get 10, 15 percent um, above market rate on our rentals because we've we've gone the extra mile uh, with our uh, uh, capital improvements. Um, and I think it's just uh, up until now, it's been a winning approach. <clears throat> well, Chris, listen, I know I'm sucking up a lot of your time. If you can, I, I want, I've got two other questions I want to ask you if that, that's sure. all right. I, anything, for, anything for Bruce or anyone that's affiliated with him. So go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, when it comes to, to forecasting in the multifamily space, you know, uh, Bruce, the Norris Group has always mentioned you as kind of a go-to in this world. Uh, what would, what could you tell our audience about how multifamily and how you believe multifamily will fare the rest of this year and, and, and kind of for the next few years? So having given my comments, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting sell everything you have. Um, I'm not selling everything that I have. Now, I'm in a different position and I acknowledge that because I literally have the bat line to anyone I need to call, attorneys, eviction specialists, whomever it may be. Um, so I get those answers fast and free. I realize not, that's not the case for everyone. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll get a lot of fast and free content there. That's a lot of the same. But the reason why I bring that up is because again, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting sell everything. This is not a doom and gloom um, a forecast that I'm giving. What I'm saying is intentional. I want to, I think I'm going to live with that word. You have to be more intentional about your investments. So going forward in, in the words of Jim Rohn, it's going to be about what it always has been in the sense that the market's going to have cycle cycles, ebbs and flows. Uh, in the last go around in, in 2007, who would have uh, thought that the, uh, residential market was going to collapse other than Bruce who would have thought that the residential market was going to collapse 
at the degree, degree it did. Um, interestingly enough, you know, one point I wrote down here for our conversation is treasuries on Monday popped to 4.63. You know, the last time they were there, June, no, the fall of 2007, just before the financial crisis. Things to be aware of. You got to be intentional. <clears throat> so uh, the forecast would be those that are intentional with their investments and those that are business minded, those that have attended to the financing on their properties. And they've they've, you know, taken a look at what do these rate adjustments mean or potentially mean um, you should do. Uh, just fine. And there's going to be opportunities coming up. There's going to be individuals, unfortunately, that have to sell. Um, and that's going to be a great time if you have some dry powder that you've been sitting on, a great time to deploy it and take advantage of it. Because again, people need a place to lay their head. Housing is always going to be needed. It cannot be taken out by AI, Jeff Bezos, or anyone else. And uh, over time, Historically, values have gone up, rental rates have gone up, vacancy stays about the same or goes down. And so it's tried and true. But at the same time, it's not something that you can dabble in. You're either in or you're out at this point. Uh, understand the politics of the state, what the laws are, get familiar with the laws, encapsulate yourself with the network of professionals that can help you in these various areas. And Maybe values will go down. Maybe they will go up. A lot of this is going to fall and rise on interest rates, of course. Just, you know, we need to watch interest rates. Um, if, and I hope I'm wrong, if rates come down and we see high fives, I think just high fives would, uh, uh, not like a high five, but high 5% uh, interest <laughs> rates, would that would send the market ablaze because people want to be involved. They believe in multifamily here locally. Uh, right now, we just have this challenge. No different than I remember in 2010, uh, one of my mentors in this space said, Chris, call me when apartment buildings go to 100,000 per unit. And I thought, 100,000 per unit? You know, like, what, what planet are you living on? Well, the next call to that gentleman was, sir, I just listed a 20 unit building for $2 million. Do you have interest? 100,000 unit. He had nailed it. And so, there, again, there's going to be uh, opportunity here. Um, and, uh, again, you know, it, it's going to be about what it always has been. Well, I think you answered my last question, but I'll see if you've got anything else. I, I was going to say, if you're talking to every multi-investor in California, multi-family investor in California, what would be your last message to them today? <laughs> my last message. Um, I think taking the fact that where the, if you're an investor and you own multifamily real estate or only, I'm sorry, investment real estate, you're in the top percentage of uh, the citizens of this country wealth wise. And just take that in and be appreciative of that because there's uh, for the vast majority, they're not in that position. There's plenty of people hurting right now that because we're in this position, they need our help. So one, I would say, be grateful for, while well, maybe it's not ideal because of the politics and rank. And again, I get all that, but Big perspective, you know what, <laughs> compared to where we could be somewhere else or another country or even in this country, but coming from different financial means. Um, I didn't come from money. You know, my wife and I have built what we have. Be, um, be grateful. Beyond that, I would say be intentional uh, with your investments. Um, you, the days are gone where you can be lackadaisy and complacent. You have to be intentional. That, that pendulum now is in a tenant's favor, probably is going to stay on that side with tenant protections and what have you. Learn how to navigate that. Stay informed. Um, yeah. And, and, and focus on that financial legacy. It, it, in my opinion, it's three pillars. You're either maximizing your current investments, fo focusing on capital improvements to get the rents up. We spent a lot of time there. Then you focus on growth, economies of scale so that no matter what they dream up, you can handle it financially and otherwise. And then if you're in your later years of investing, uh, is it cash or properties you want to give to the kids? Do the kids want to be landlords? Do they want to be business partners? Do you know what that means? Have you had that conversation? Do not just drop it in their lap because then they're going to come to me, except they're going to also have lawyers at their side. And that's probably not where you want things to be. Um, so, you know, have that conversation. So. Chris, listen, before we sign off, uh, there's one thing I want to touch on. And we haven't gone to any space in here for this. So I just want to ask you personally, if you can, if for our listeners that want to find out about you, whether it's your YouTube, other social media, 
how, how do they get in touch with you? How do they tie into you? So yeah, social media. So I would say best place to go first is our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash the apartment dealer. I have probably a couple hundred hours now worth of free uh, wow. educational content there. Um, much like this, where we're going out and interviewing people in the investment real estate space. So youtube.com forward slash the apartment dealer. And then Instagram, if you go there, uh, which uh, is going to be also forward slash the apartment dealer. Don't worry. I'm not posting what I had for lunch and like all this, you know, it, it's real estate uh, uh, specific. And um, a lot of times you'll find there snippets of the longer content that's on YouTube. So if you only have a limited amount of time, you're going to get, you know, the talking points, if you will, on our Instagram. Um, and that, that probably will help the uh, viewers out uh, the most. Well, that's awesome. Chris, again, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Thank you for spending your time. I'm grateful for you giving us your time and your knowledge. You've given us a wealth of information. So uh, to everybody listening, thanks so much for being here today. And we can't wait to see you next time. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. For more information on hard money loans, trustee investing, and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For more information on passive investing through the DBL Capital Real Estate Investment Fund, please visit dblcapital.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under the California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.